So fear, this F-E-A-R, uh, it's false expectations appearing real. Yes. So um, before, if I was still in my fear, I would have already been having conversations with the both of you saying, oh my gosh, I can't do this. Uh, I, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to call them and say, I'm going to cancel. If I was to let fear still rule me, that's what would have happened. But I said, no, you cannot let false expectations appear real to you because they're not. So that's how I get through things when that fear does rear its little nose. I don't let it rear its head this, like its nose. And I'm like, uh-uh, I'll hit it. And it, I have to like say, get out of here. You are not real. I heard it through the grapevine. Welcome. It's the AA Grapevine Half Hour Variety Hour featuring the collective voices of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm Don, an alcoholic in Greensboro, North Carolina. Hey everybody, I'm Sam, an alcoholic in Palm Springs, California. Sam, I got this quote from an email list I subscribe to. It's dailydow at buddyc.org. And Dow is spelled T-A-O, Daily Dow. I love this story. It's mm -hmm. the Taoist farmer. There was once a farmer in ancient China who owned a horse. You are so lucky, his neighbor told him, to have a horse to pull a cart for you. Maybe, the farmer replied. One day he didn't latch the gate properly and the horse ran away. Oh no, that is terrible news. Such bad luck. Maybe. A few days later, the horse returned, bringing with it six wild horses. How fantastic. You are so lucky. Maybe, the farmer replied. The following week, the farmer's son was breaking in one of the wild horses when it threw him to the ground, breaking his leg. Oh no, such bad luck all over again. Maybe. And then the next day, soldiers came and took away all the young men to fight in the army. The farmer's son was left behind. You are so lucky. Maybe, the farmer replied. I just love that story. No matter what happens. It's totally that thing of not making something good or bad. Not judging it, even if bad things happen, just to be available to it. Ugh. It's it's hard to do. You know, it is, but I, I know I still do call things good and bad. But when I'm trying to be mindful about how I'm living in this world, they're actually not bad things and good things. They're things that I don't like and things that I do like. And one of the things that I learned in early recovery is things that I do like are not necessarily all that good for me. And things that I don't like might be really good for me. But there I go using good and bad again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there you go. I don't know. To live in such a way that I don't demand that the world fit my internal template of the way that I have it in mind everything should be it's a much easier way to live that i've learned in aa and i mean the Taoists were talking about this for centuries so what you're saying is one of the things that we're learning to deal with in aa is alcoholics seeking recovery is how to work and live within the human condition <laughs> well i could sum it up this way an expectation is a resentment waiting to happen. <laughs> so uh, no expectations. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> expectations are bad, okay? Sam, who's our guest today? Don, today's guest is Tana C. We'll get to know her a bit, and then we'll dip into the Ask It basket, which used to be Ask the Old Timer, but we decided that needed to change because it was bad. <laughs> and the Ask It basket is good. <laughs> Hey, Don, how can I support the Grapevine podcast? Since the Grapevine is self-supporting, we don't sell ad space in our magazines, on our website, or even on our podcast. Grapevine doesn't even accept contributions from AA members. What? If you want to support the podcast, visit aagrapevine.org and click on store. Hi, 
Hi, everyone. My name is Tana C. I am from San Felipe Pueblo, New Mexico. I have uh, six years of uh, sobriety. Ooh, thanks for joining us, Tana. What? So what was going on with you when you got sober that made you want to come to AA? Or did you want to come to AA? <laughs> did you really want to come? <laughs> I didn't want to come. <laughs> I was introduced uh-huh. to AA through the... Uh, court system. I was forced to go to AA. My first experience with AA was I went into the uh, Albuquerque Indian Center to attend a meeting. I heard people saying, my name is, and I'm an alcoholic. And I said, I am not going to say that because I am not an alcoholic and I will not associate with something I don't want to be or I am not. Wow. (laughs) So Teddy, you got a nudge from the judge. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. A couple nudges. Yeah. Did you have an idea of what AA was? I did not. I, you know, to tell you the truth, I never heard of it. Wow. I didn't know that um, there was such thing as being an alcoholic. I knew there were people that drank a lot, mm-hmm. that had problems, that got in trouble, but I didn't know the word alcoholic. Mm-hmm. And then when I got into the rooms, I started getting educated by the people in the rooms, listening to their stories. Kate, that seed was planted. The seed was, yeah. You, you said that you got the nudge from the judge a couple times, right? Yes. Did you have resentment towards the judge? Yeah, I had resentment towards everything and everyone because how dare mm-hmm. they tell me that I have a problem that I'm not a good human, right? How dare they? Uh, so yeah, I had a resentment against mm-hmm. a lot of people. How did you come to accept the fact that you really did have a problem with alcohol? Like I said, did a lot of work on myself. Like I said, the seed was planted. It started growing little by little because once that seed was planting, I couldn't use like I did before. I knew there was something better out there. And then I did a couple programs, rehab transitional living programs for women. Eventually, I started to accept that I did have a problem. And the problem was Tana. Did you go back to AA? I tried other programs. AA is the one that I stuck with because... I found my tribe, right? The people that I can associate with, not necessarily my yeah. Native American tribe, but my tribe of alcoholic that I had something in common with. We were unsuccessful at drinking. Yeah. It's so powerful to me how cohesive that one thing is at making me a part of a group of people wrecked in the same boat. Yeah. We might not always get along in meetings. We might not always agree with what others have to say, but we do have that one thing in common. We cannot drink successfully. We're not bad people. We are just good people that have a bad disease. What was the factor that drew you to AA after trying other ways of staying sober? During the period of working on myself and I started to drop my walls and and let people get to know me and see me. I had to stop digging my heels in, start staying after the meetings, letting people get to know me. I get to know them. Eventually, you know, they started saying, hey, why don't you come to lunch with us? Um, They kept telling me, keep coming back. Something the judge never told me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, We we really don't want to keep coming back to the (laughs) courtroom. Exactly. Exactly. But uh, in AA, they told me, keep coming back. The meeting I go to, there is so much recovery. One day we had five people get chips and it added up to 200 plus years of recovery. Can you believe that? Whoa. What kind of meeting is your home group format? Um, It's an open meeting. What does that mean? It means that anyone can attend. I know we've had guests come in and say, Mm -hmm. I'm just here to observe. I'm doing a class. You know, I would like to get more information on how these meetings Mm -hmm. work. And then they're open to people that identify as alcoholic addict. I hear a lot of good things in it. I always hear something I could use. And I always have my phone and I always take down little little nuggets of what, like, oh my gosh, I really like that. Maybe I could share this with someone that might need to hear it someday. I carry a notebook in my pocket. (laughs) (laughs) I do the same thing too. It's awesome. (laughs) I think it wasn't actually in this meeting. And I've been going to this meeting for about a year. That light bulb did not go off until about a year ago. That, wow, this person has gone through what I've been through and has experienced. What does a week look like for you? So I was a uh, peer support worker 
I share my experience, strength, and hope with another person that comes in seeking rehabilitation. So I was working in that field. I'm still working in that field anyway. Is that um, like working in a treatment center? Yes. So that really helped me, right? Because they say you have to give it away to keep it. So I spent time with alcoholics and addicts, sharing my experience, strength, and hope, letting them know that recovery is possible. So I would push Alcoholics Anonymous and share my experience with it and let them know that we're like animals, right? We walk in a pack and if an uh, animal strays away, they're easily picked off. Mm -hmm. So you, you stay in the pack, you stay close to your people. Oh. Their strength in numbers. Now I am working with the indigenous community, which was what I wanted to do from the very beginning when I got my social work degree. When I was out doing my thing in my alcoholism, I was out running the streets in Albuquerque, New Mexico. There's a lot of urban Indians. They leave their reservations to get into the big city, and sometimes the alcoholism takes them. And I would see these people in the streets, drunk, passed out, weather-worn. Their skin's really weather-worn. And I didn't want to um, become one of them because I was on my way. Sorry, I'm going to get emotional. So I said to myself that I have to do better. Because this is not what my creator wanted me to be. My ancestors did not survive for me to be doing this. <clears throat> so I had, I, I said, I'm going to do something about this. So I went back to school, got my education, and now this is what I'm doing. I'm working with the indigenous community and sharing my experience, strength, and hope with them to let them know that there is a way out and that AA did help me. It's still continuing to help me. I'm practicing my program and I'm here for them. That deep surrender that I could feel you describing and then connection that this is not who I was meant to be. When did that first come to you? Uh, when I found the AA groups, I saw other indigenous people in there and knew that, yes, that this is possible. And then also um, my partner, she makes me see or helps me see the Native American that I am, um, that we are strong people. It's amazing how my thought process has changed tremendously. Also, I'm really proud to be Native American because when I was growing up, I was bullied. I was born in San Francisco, California. We moved to the reservation when I was seven years old. So everything was new. I went from inside utilities like a restroom, running water, right to a reservation where they had the outhouses. We had to fetch the water and bring it in. So when I moved there, I didn't speak like them. I didn't look like them. But I just recently had a spiritual awakening to where I came full circle. I went to being bullied, hating my community, not wanting to be around the indigenous community, to seeing what we had, the indigenous community had become to working with the indigenous community now and giving back. Powerful. Are there obstacles that are specific to the Native American community, the indigenous community within the urban environment and then within the, the reservation environment that make alcoholism that much more of an obstacle? Uh, it's a generational trauma. We carry that okay. with us still, even though it happened generations and generations and generations ago. It's in our DNA. We carry it with us. We have to make sure that we work on ourselves, help our communities to see that it is generational trauma and stop the cycle, right? Like one alcoholic talking with another alcoholic, when that happened to me, when I was on the receiving end of that, I knew that that alcoholic that had found a solution knew what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. And what I'm getting from you is a similar thing I guess in the terms of today, it's intersectionality of when a Native American is also alcoholic, another Native American recovered alcoholic can speak with that person in a way that someone else cannot. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, Always. definitely. Yes. And that's why I want to work with my community, because I believe I can connect. I don't want to call them a client, but with the other person. 
it sounds to me like what you're saying is with another Native American, so what has to be dealt with is this generational trauma. What is the solution? Because alcohol is not the solution. For me, it was being proud of who I am, participating in the tradition, learning my culture, and just walking proud. I wasn't put on this earth to do what I was doing. My ancestors survived for a reason. So, you know, I have to remember that, that they're walking with me. How do the steps come into this? The steps are helping me live as a good human being, right? Me as a Native American, yes, I believe that these steps are are geared towards me. Yeah. I mean, even though that they are written the way they're written with, you know, the word God, I replace that with my creator. Mm -hmm. For some people that don't like the word God, when I moved to the reservation, they were practicing Catholics, right? Because the Spaniards came through and brought their uh, Catholic religion on the Pueblos. Yeah. So it was forced Mm -hmm. that left the sour taste in my mouth. I didn't want to be forced to do something. So as I was growing up, being forced to do that, follow the Catholic religion, I didn't want to have anything to do with God. I was learning that God was a punishing God. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. And then so when I walked into AA, I was like, oh my gosh, now they're talking about God. I don't want to talk about God. I, you know, God was not there for me, blah, blah, Mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. You know, why am I the way I am? So I had to replace that with, creator my creator it made it more personalized for myself and they say find a god of your own understanding it's not a religious program it's a spiritual program i found my spirituality through aa i had problems with god when i came in at one point i was at a meeting where they were reading we agnostics as they were reading i wrote down every metaphor every reference to a higher power And one of them was great creator. I really responded to that because I'm an artist and I've always felt that my creativity came from somewhere else and appeared. It was a gift for me. Right. I'm an artist as well. You know, in my alcoholism, I kicked it to the curb. I threw it to the side, right? I just said, ah, you stay here. Uh, I'm busy doing other things. So as I got into my recovery and started working a program, I started feeling creative again. I had to find an outlet and the outlet was painting or just creating things, drawing things, putting things together with odds and ends I had around my house. Well, Mm -hmm. being creative is the opposite of being (laughs) self-destructive, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tana, this has been a great discussion. Let's bring in one of our listeners. It's time for the Ask It Basket. What's that? That's the name Bill W. gave the basket that was passed around for questions at conventions. We want your questions for our guests. General recovery questions, newcomer questions, AA history. Basically, it's our AA AMA. AA Ask Me Anything. Got a question for the Ask It Basket? Call in and record it at 212-870-3418 or email it to podcast at aagrapevine.org. You can find these and more at aagrapevine.org slash podcast. And now let's dip into the basket. Hi, I'm JK. I'm from Palm Springs. And my question is, how do you find the balance in your life between going to meetings, being of service, and taking care of yourself and finding your tribe. Like I had stated earlier, I do art. So I have to find time to do my art and get whatever's in my head out. And the way I do that is just to get a blank canvas and just whatever colors come to mind, throw them on the canvas and then go from there. And I always find something appears. It's amazing how that works. I I found my tribe in AA. I found other members that I could depend on, hang out with outside of meetings. We have a lot of common interests. Most of us are nerds. (laughs) And it's pretty cool. It's really neat to find other quirky people to where you don't feel like you are the odd one out, right? We all found each other. And it's so amazing, so cool to have those people around me, my tribe. Thanks, Tana. What my experience is, when I first got sober, I needed to fully immerse myself in AA. 
because I had to change the way that I thought about the world. That's what AA did, was it changed the way I thought and the way I respond to the world. And the only way I could do that was to really be deep in the deep end of AA every day, going to meetings and, and challenging my thinking against what I was hearing in the meetings. And I'm learning to, oh, that's an expectation. Oh, I didn't know that was a resentment. Or, oh, I didn't know I hid my drinking. I didn't know that throwing my bottles in five different trash cans was hiding my drinking. Oh, so slowly I learned how I operate. And through working the steps, I learned what are the character defects that I act out of. I asked God to remove those things, my higher power, the great creator. Then I can try and live in such a way that I'm living one day of time and trying to be service to others. At that point, I started to back off on meetings, and that's when I can say, okay, now, uh, can I do this outside of AA? I've got to take the training wheels off and get back into the stream of life, and I can carry this with me in my, in my family and at work, but I found that I had to always pay attention to where am I getting squirrely? When am I starting to be dissatisfied with life? At that point, I need to add more meetings again. Early on, I had a, a business that I was operating, and it was a lot of work. And I was like, I don't have time for AA. But I found if I went to an AA meeting in the middle of the week, work went better. So I had to really pay attention to what was going on and have a sponsor and be talking all this over and... For me, it was about three or four meetings I could have some equilibrium. That has remained for me as long as I've been sober. Finding my tribe happens through being involved and being connected to others. And I find that I'm not looking so much as to be part of a group as to just be a decent human being. And then I become yep, part of a group. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No one wants to be around someone that's mean, nasty, rude. Right. No one wants to be around that. You know, I was uh, sitting here. I've got a, a little bowl with my uh, my various chips in it. And one of them has unity, service and recovery on each side of the triangle. That instantly takes me to what JK's question is asking. Unity, service and recovery, recovery, going to meetings and working the program of Alcoholics Anonymous service, finding your tribe, unity, the fellowship. Mm -hmm. So how do I balance recovery or my recovery, unity, service, and recovery with taking care of myself? Well, first of all, doing those things is a huge part of taking care of myself. Mm -hmm. When I do these things, self-care shows up. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that happens is I am special. <laughs> well, you're but special, I, all right. There are certain things that I need to do to take care of myself. The fact that my alcoholism, mm -hmm. my checking out of reality today is not a problem. I don't do that anymore. But being an alcoholic, my particular nature is I want some rigidity. I want some predictability. I want a formula. Wearing life like a loose garment, that means my recovery too, because my recovery is my life. So I don't need to hold so rigidly to my recovery. I need to wear it like a loose garment. Now, I don't cast it aside, and I need to be able to pay attention. Like you were saying, Don, I'm feeling squirrely now. Well, something's out of balance. But the thing is, there is no rule for my recovery, for my doing all these things that JK's mentioned in X proportion to each other. It changes. The degree that I need to be involved in meetings or being of service or taking care of myself or being amongst my fellows, that changes throughout my experience of living. I need to be aware of it and see where I need to focus. Can I plug something? Absolutely. So it's titled the 28th Annual Red Road AA Convention. That is going to be in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We're going to have AA speakers, Al-Anon speakers, marathon meetings, a powwow, a DJ dance. That is May 5th, 6th, and 7th, 2023, coming up here soon. 
Yeah, and that's going to be held at the Marriott. Right. Where can people find out more information about that? Oh, yes. They can go to www.nmredroad.org. And that would be N-M-R-E-D-R-O-A-D dot org. Yes, sir. That's right. Or they could go to aa.org, I believe, also. Thank you so much. This has been a real pleasure. Yeah, thank you. This was fun. It's time for listener feedback. Hey, folks, why not write us at podcast at aagrapevine.org or give us a call at 212-870-3418 with your thoughts. Operators are standing by. Thank you for calling the AA Grapevine podcast. Your call is very important to us. Please stay on. All right. We received this email from Paula about the Women's International Conference episode. Hey, I'm 22 minutes into the podcast and I'm waiting for real content. There was a horse, diverse women, Spanish ladies. Okay, please give me something, a story, some vignettes. Finding this lacking of character in AA standards for excellence. Paula B. Thanks, Paula. It seems the anthologies are not for you. Don't worry. The anthologies are going to be rare. We can't get into the emotional depth we do in longer interviews. The short ones are more superficial, and I was concerned about that. But instead, it was all joy and community. Those are AA principles as well. Joy counts. Thanks for writing. And now we have a great email from Nathan L. Thanks from a newcomer. Dear Don and Sam, I'm a newcomer to AA and am 75 days sober today. I only learned about the podcast about four or five weeks ago and have officially made it through every episode now. Thanks to you, I've been able to take AA with me while traveling for work. While I've only been to 77 meetings in 75 days, I feel like I can credit myself with almost twice that number because of the time I've spent with you. On a different note, I walked into the doors of AA after a single car accident that was caused by a combination of depression and anxiety attack and my alcoholism. I'm blessed that I was not physically injured, and more importantly, my 11-year-old daughter was not either, though I know I'll be making amends to her for the rest of my life. The only way those circumstances could have happened is because I was incredibly sick, mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Alcoholism, being so cunning, baffling, and powerful, resonated with me because I was never a daily drinker, morning drinker, and I've gone 30 or 40 or 90 days without a drink, though I now know I was white-knuckling it in the truest sense. As someone said in a meeting many weeks ago, it's not how much you drink or how frequently you drink, it's what happens to your brain when you drink. Wow! After finishing the big book and living sober, I'm working on step four, and I've been blessed with an incredible sponsor with 30 plus years of sobriety. While my legal circumstances may put both my freedom and career in jeopardy, I feel blessed today because I know I'm much better than I was. I have a greater connection to my higher power and I'm focused on doing the next right thing. I'm a better father and husband. I'm trying to already give back through service work. I understand the serenity prayer better than I ever have. And I have faith that God's will will not give me more than God's grace can handle in my life, per one of your interviews. I'm grateful to have the fellowship of AA and my experience already has become much more than just about dealing with the disease of alcoholism. I can see the proverbial miracle already starting to happen and trust that I can get through this time of turmoil to create an even better life for myself and my family. Thanks for bringing the experience, strength, and hope of AA to thousands through the podcast. I appreciate your prayers and support as I continue my journey and try to follow the will of my higher power. Sincerely, Nathan L. Harrisonburg, Virginia. Nathan, thank you so much for letting us know how the podcast has been helpful to you. I love that you're working with a sponsor and are already helping others. 
Trust God, clean house, help others. That's Dr. Bob's shorthand for what we do. I hope to sit in a meeting with you someday. Keep on doing what you're doing. Thanks for writing, Nathan. Do you live far from AA meetings? Are you a loner or stationed far away? Do you have a language or cultural barrier? Are you homebound? Do you use online meetings? Is it difficult to find AA meetings where you live? Tell us how you stay sober. Share your story at aagrapevine.org slash share. Stories are due by June 15th, 2023. Poor old Jake is an alcoholic. Not only that, he's an agnostic. To make matters worse, he's an insomniac. And to top it all off, he's dyslexic. Any night of the week, you can find him sitting on the corner of his bed, sipping whiskey from a coffee mug and wondering if there really is a dog. (laughs) (laughs) it's really not that funny thanks for joining us the aa grapevine half hour variety hour is posted every monday and is produced by aa grapevine inc we don't speak for aa as a whole we share the experience strength and hope of members to help others recover from alcoholism Podcast info, including how to call in, is at aagrapevine.org slash podcast. Find AA Grapevine on Instagram and the AA Grapevine channel on YouTube. All things Grapevine are available at aagrapevine.org. If you want to know more about AA, Google Alcoholics Anonymous and your city or visit aa.org.